So the talk today is called The Meaning, Value, and Practice of Critical Thinking, and that's exactly what it's going to be about. So it's basically about you, because you're a critical thinker. You're a human being, and what makes you special amongst all of the other beings is that you can think. You can use higher order thinking and your rationality to do things that other beings on this planet can't do. So you're special because you are a thinker. And because you're a being, you're gonna die. You're all gonna die. You don't know when, you don't know how, but that's what happens to things that are alive, they die. So the important question for a human being is, how should you live? What should you do with your time? I don't know what you think your most valuable resource is. It's, it's time, it actually is time. It's the only thing you can't get back or buy. So the question is, how should you spend your time? And if you look at where you are and what you're doing right now, it looks like you care about your thoughts because you came to a talk about thinking. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to think about our thoughts. We're going to be thinking about thinking on purpose. So I'm going to read the abstract to you slowly, and that's going to be how we go through the hour time that we have. Thinking is an activity, and activities take time. Is thinking a waste of time? Be thinking about doing long division, or be thinking about trying to read a map to try to get somewhere. Be thinking about trying to get the information by engaging in a book, you know, physical books and libraries. Why would you do that when you can just Google it? Why would you? look at a map and stare at it and memorize your directions and then leave your house trying to get to your destination when you can just punch in your destination and follow Google Maps without thinking. Why would you? Like that's an actual question. Is thinking the long way a waste of your time? Socrates was sentenced to death for corrupting the youth, for making them think. And at his trial, he said that the unexamined life is not worth living. He wanted people to examine their lives and to think for themselves. So Socrates, much like many of you who have seen me, was always in public areas trying to get the kids to think, trying to get people to think for themselves, pissing people off, yes, questioning things, demanding better answers, questioning the answers, and they killed him. For corrupting the youth. This is a painting of his death where he is being given hemlock poison, which the government decided was his destiny. Did Socrates die for nothing? He died wanting people to think for themselves. He died because he wouldn't shut up. He wanted to ask questions. Is thinking a waste of your time? What's the point of thinking the long way, the hard way, thinking for yourself when there's so many shortcuts available? Like, yes, you can go to the library and the librarian will help you how to do research that you then have to do it yourself, but you can go to ChatGPT and it will write a paper for you. So really, why, why think for yourself the hard way, the long way, when there's all these other shortcuts available? Thinking is a skill, but it's a skill that you don't need to get better at. Think about what skills are. Skills are things that you can practice. You can make yourself better at them or worse than them. Think about basketball. Basketball is my favorite sport. I like to dribble the ball up and down for it. So there's the Dr. J that I wish I was named after, <laughs> Julius Irving. He, he made basketball, basketball. In my opinion, best basketball player, period. Jamal, we can talk about that later. There's people that are better at some skills and then there's people that are worse at those. And I wasn't going to go on a rant about who I thought was the worst. So here's what Google says. Here's a bunch of lists. Skills, they're things that you can be better at or worse at. Just like basketball, thinking is a skill. Critical thinking is a skill. 
Some of us think really well. Some of us don't think really well. And doesn't it seem like some people don't think at all? <laughs> Since critical thinking is a skill, we can practice it just like we can practice a free throw. Someone tell Shaq that. And then we can be better at it. But then the question is still like, why be better at thinking? You have all these shortcuts. And in this lecture, that's what we'll be discussing, the value of it, the meaning of it, the practice of it, and you'll see they're all super intertwined. So I'll be back and forth. But that is our focus, the meaning, the value, and the practice of critical thinking. So first I'll talk about the meaning, then I'll talk about the value, then I'll talk about the practice, then I'll put them all together, and then we'll move on. So let's start with what it even means, critical thinking. Critical thinking is a process. It's not just one thing, like a light switch, on or off, yes or no, black or white. It's a process. There's a lot of things involved. Critical thinking is a process by which you are evaluating data, raw data, and transforming it into information. And if you want to know the differences between data and information, check out my YouTube video on it, because those are not the same thing. Information is useful data. There's two kinds of data. There's lots of kinds of information. When you're engaging in critical thinking, you're thinking your attention is on your own thoughts. Critical thinking means thinking about your thinking, questioning your thoughts. So you, you Google some question because you're taking a test and you're trying to find the answer because you didn't do your homework but you still need to think about whether that's the right answer because who puts information on the internet? Everybody and their mom has a blog about something. So who's got the truth? Who's got the real information, the good information? Critical thinking is not only finding an answer, but investigating whether it's true, right Brandon? Whether it's good, whether it's reliable, whether you can trust it. You have to have background questions. Like who funded this website that has this information? What's in it for them for me to believe that what they're saying is true? And often if you follow the money, you'll get to people's motivations. So critical thinking, what does it mean? It means you're using your mind, your attention, your time, to wonder what's true when you have that information already available. Not only is it a process by which you evaluate data, transform that data into something useful for you, and then question whether that information really is beneficial, because just as it's true, if it's true doesn't mean it's beneficial. Something can be true, but not beneficial. Imagine your future husband or wife or spouse is the CEO of a cigarette company. It might be true that cigarettes are bad, but that information would be really unbeneficial to you. Because how can you sell something you know is really bad? There's information you might want to overlook because it's beneficial for you to overlook facts, right? Real life. Just because it's true doesn't mean it's beneficial. Not only is it a process by which you evaluate what information is beneficial, is good, is true, is reliable, it's also a skill that enables you to do a whole bunch of other things with your mind, like analysis, to analyze something, to break it down, assessment, to judge whether something is good or bad, synthesis, to take information and put it together, finding patterns, like if your friends jump off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? Well, let's see. If all of my friends who jumped off a bridge ended up in this really cool pool, then then yeah, maybe I maybe I would. Maybe I would. So what you want to do with your thoughts is synthesize information, analyze information, assess information. And if you are a professor, think about what you ask your students to do to demonstrate that they've learned information. And if you're a student, think about all of those rubrics that accompany your assignments from your professors. They are asking you to assess information, to synthesize information, put it together. 
Like, what does this author and this other author have in common? What do they agree about? And this is Bloom's, Benjamin Bloom's taxonomy. On the left, the original. On the right, the edited version. And the lowest thing you do is at the bottom of this pyramid. The higher up the pyramid, the more you're using your mind. If you believe that you're a creative person, you don't just understand the materials with which you're working. You're not just applying techniques that you might have learned from studying Giorgio O'Keefe, if you like painting, but you're doing more than that. To create an essay, you have to understand the language, you have to apply some kind of theory, you have to think about grammar and spelling, so you're synthesizing all these other skills. All of this above understanding requires critical thinking. Critical thinking is essential for creating anything, for evaluating anything, for analyzing anything, for applying anything. And that's a part of what it means, but it's wrapped up with the practice of critical thinking. What it means to think critically involves practicing a whole bunch of verbs, process verbs. So if you think about this analyzing portion of Bloom's taxonomy, what your professors often ask you to do is break up information into parts and explore different relationships. To demonstrate that you understand, to prove that you know something, take what your teacher taught you and then apply it. And then how can you do that? Well, those are those process verbs on the right. Calculate something, categorize something, classify something, compare and contrast, so and so and so and so. To do anything like that, you have to employ critical thinking. You're thinking, yep, for sure, but you're also thinking about your thoughts because there's lots of different ways in which you can compare two things. Let's move on to the value of thinking, but we're going to come back to the meaning. Critical thinking reinforces understanding. So if you remember that bottom portion of Bloom's taxonomy, you can't apply something unless you understand it, right? You have to understand what blue means so that you can say Grace's sweater is blue, Sheed's jacket is blue, Sago's shirt is blue, the floor is blue, Jacob's shirt is blue. You cannot apply the theory of what blue is to actual entities and call something blue without understanding what blue is. So that's how critical thinking reinforces understanding. Supports innovative solutions, enhances decision-making, bolsters healthy connections. Okay, so here's a bunch of really big words and phrases that are supposed to get at the value of using your own brain. And by the end of this, we're going to return to think more deeply about what it means to promote effective communication, to enable identifying potential or actual risks or opportunities. Although, just if you trust me, believe that these really are values of critical thinking. I wish you could move that thing. I'm going to try to move it. It'll be able to just from the ads. We're thinking about the value of critical thinking. There's not only one kind of value. There's more than one kind of value. And in philosophy, you can study. Thanks, Chloe. That's why I need it. This is totally fun. You can study things like value in philosophy, amongst other things. And if you were to take this idea of value seriously, you can see that there's more than one kind of value. There is the things that are, there are, the things that are instrumentally valuable. These are things that have value because they're an instrument for something else. And then there are the things that are intrinsically valuable. And those are the things that are not valuable because they can get you something, but because you just want to have them for themselves. An example of an item that has only instrumental value is money. Money is valuable. You want money. 
Not because you just want money. You don't just want money. You want money because you want what money can get you. If you ever have a Bank of America account and you open up the app, it says, what do you want the power to do? Well, because money is power. If you don't have enough money to fly to Yugoslavia, you don't have the power to go to Yugoslavia. Money can get you things. And that's why you want money. You want money because of what it can get you. It's a tool, it's an instrument. You do not want money just to have money. And if you think you do, then we should remember that in the 20s in Germany, people were throwing their money into fire because the alternative was to spend their money to buy wood to have a fire, but the wood was more expensive than the worth of their dollars. So in the 20s in Germany, because of hyperinflation, people were not taking their money and buying things. They were using it by burning it to stay warm. Of course, not all over Germany and not everyone, but they, these are known cases. If all of a sudden we had hyperinflation in America, you wouldn't want money. You would want something that has way more value to you, like a sweater. Hopefully that helps you see that money has instrumental value. And if you want, we can chat, chat more later about how it's not intrinsically valuable. It's not something you want for its own sake. It's something you want because it helps you get something else. And I believe that critical thinking allow it to be represented by this brain lifting weights. Critical thinking has instrumental value because when you are really good at thinking critically, you can get all the really good things that you want. But even if it's not going to get you something else, critical thinking is just good, just period, just for itself, not because it can get something else. So if you think about the value of critical thinking, we're turning to that previous slide, it reinforces understanding. If you can apply a theory to something else, you're proving that you know it. And knowing is just good. It's just good to have understanding. Critical thinking bolsters healthy connections. Being in good relationships with good people is just good. It's good for us as social beings to stand in relations with other people. We're gonna to return to that idea again. Let's move on to the practice of it. Even though in the background we've been talking about what it is, really in the practice of actively listening, actively listening, curiously observing, not just closing your ears, you can't close your ears. You can't close your eyes, right? You can close your eyes. So you don't have to observe something. If you're walking down the street and you see a very poor woman, you can look the other way, you're still thinking like you didn't see her, but if someone's screaming for help, you can't close your ears. There's still a difference between hearing words and noise and then actively listening, allowing whatever you're hearing to penetrate your cognition to move you to act. Critical thinking involves processing the information that's coming in for your mouth. Sorry, that's coming in for your That's what it means to actively listen, to be a member of the information coming in. Critical thinking involves the practice of asking relevant questions. The who, and where, why. You're watching a commercial, and it's a commercial for Bud Light, and it's someone with a Bud Light, and then there's a whole bunch of people dancing around, and they look so fun. And it's like, bring your butt, Bud. <laughs> and then... If you buy this beer, you're going to mysteriously have a bunch of friends. <laughs> you're watching the commercial, and you need to stop and think. Because if you're not stopping to think, you're not thinking. Critical thinking is an activity, and activity takes time. So you need to stop and think, wait a minute, who, what, when, where, why? Who funded this commercial? What do they get out of me believing what they're selling? Is it good for you to drink alcohol? We're going to return to this. When we were talking about the meaning of critical thinking, I had thought about what it is to think critically. And for that, I just blew on because all of you love your education. You would not be on a college campus if you didn't care about your thoughts and your future and your education. So blue taxonomy helps us understand the objectives that are, that are attempting to be satisfied in the classroom, uh, virtual or otherwise. So the practice of critical thinking involves all the process verbs to do things with your mind. A verb is a thing that you do. It's an action. Except when it comes to critical thinking, we're talking about what you do with your mind. And therefore, with your time. Because everything you do takes time. And then you're dead. That's when you have time left. So all of those verbs that you see, all of those are things that if you do, you are practicing critical thinking. So I said some more about the meaning and the value and the practice. These are all great, oh, wonderful jargon. But what, what does it really mean? What does it really mean? What I want to do is kind of show you that all of these are interrelated to you. Like there's nothing you can do to get away from the fact that if you think critically, your life will go better, and if you don't, your life will be less good. 
So you're a human being. You engage in activities. They're saying that you do. Alexander is a basketball coach. Lots of you have jobs. You can come in. Come on in, Liz. There's lots of things that you do, right? One of them is coming to spa. You can do yoga. You can read a book. You can paint your nails. You can get a job. You can make a burger. You can play with a parrot. Parrot? I don't know what that is. There's so many things that you can do with your mind. And I'm trying to help you understand that one of them is just using your brain. So there's lots of different types of actions. And we're only going to talk about two. Voluntary actions, involuntary actions. I've got a really interesting theory about motion and action. Is and I will a paper about lots of you on motion. So like my brow, where it's academia. Check out that paper published in the European Journal of Analytical Philosophy. But going back to how there's more than one kind of action. Some things you do without intending to do them. No intention. There are things you are doing right now, even if you don't want to be doing them. For example, who's hard of beating? Yeah, all of you. And your heart is beating. That's the thing you're doing without intending, without wanting, without wishing. Your heart is beating. And you're also breathing, right? Like you got this thing about you, your biological thing. And so you have to breathe or else you'll or you're dead. But there's also voluntary actions. And these are things that will not happen unless you make them happen. Wait a minute. What about the people who are really good at sports? She, you're really good at sports, right? Heck yeah. Should we break his, break his ankles in the paint? Just kidding. What about people that are really good at sports? Doesn't it seem like they have good stamina? Doesn't it seem like they can go a really long time running around without stopping? Like they can run a four on four, full court, and they're fine. There's all these books, these are just three, that teach you how to be an athlete. And they teach you by practicing your breath and by working on stamina that you can transform yourself into a really high performing athlete. So it turns out that your heart rate is something you can control. If you breathe and meditate, you'll slow your heart rate down. If you want to get really good at diving, you have to learn how to do that. You can control your heart. You can run and do jumping jacks, and all of a sudden your heart rate goes up. You can also control your breathing. And there are certain people with certain jobs that they better breathe to relax. They better breathe in a certain way to get pumped up. Like, does that ring a bell? Pregnancy. Pregnancy to get birth. You have to practice how to breathe. Breathing and your heart. Your lungs and your heart, breathing and having blood pump throughout your body are both things that can happen without you intending, and you can also take control over your heart and over your lungs. Your brain is an organ, just like your lungs, just like your wrist, just like your heart. Your brain is an organ, and you can train it through critical thinking. Is critical thinking voluntary or involuntary? Sorry, lost the punchline. It's voluntary. You have to think on purpose. You have to stop and say, wait a minute, why did she say that? Wait a minute, what's in it for her? Wait a minute, is this source reliable? Wait a minute. If you are not thinking on purpose, if you are not engaging in critical thinking, the thinking that's happening inside of you, but it's herd-like mentality. You're not thinking for yourself. So all of the data coming in, comes from all of the other people with an agenda to push you towards something. Everyone wants you to believe what they want you to believe. They want you to buy whatever they're selling. Everyone has intentions. And if you don't become intentional with your own thoughts, then you are going to be pushed into buying that thing or believing that thing. And I'm saying critical thinking is when you use your brain, your mind intentionally and you the label to see what is it and do you want to buy this product and do you want to put it in your body? Thinking, critical thinking, is a voluntary action. It's something that will only happen if you intend. So how do you build critical thinking skills? Well, there's things I'll talk to you about. Pattern recognition, reasonable inferences, and impartial observations. Pattern recognition is when you make a wide range of observations and then you ask yourself, what do these things have in common? I know so many people who have PhDs. How did they get to grad school in the first place? 
Oh, they love to read. Okay. So when I have a kid, I want to make sure that I'm encouraging them to love read because if they don't love to read, they're not going to do well in grad school. And why would they want to go and get a master's or PhD? Well, you find the similarities amongst the people you want to be like, and then you copy those. That seems to work fine. Reasonable inferences is when you're considering potential cause and effect strings. Like if I do this, what's going to happen? If I come late, what's going to happen? If I don't show up, what's going to happen? What might happen? All of that requires modal thinking, where you're thinking about something that beyond, goes beyond reality. And to be a good critical thinker, you need to be thinking about cause and effect. If you want some effect, if you want to live in a cabin with woods, for example, you have to reverse engineer your life. What kind of job do I need so that in 10 years from now, I could afford a cabin in the woods? Reverse engineering your life means having a goal, the effect you want to bring about, and then thinking about all the things that you could do to get you there, and all the things you need to avoid to make sure that you can get there. Hypothetical syllogisms are something that you would learn in logic, again, study philosophy. It's when you consider a chain of causes and effects. Like, if I go to school, then I'll meet someone who's studious. If I meet someone who's studious, maybe I can date someone who's studious. If I meet someone who's studious, maybe I can marry someone who's studious. And if I marry someone who's studious, maybe I can have a book club with my whole family. Mm -hmm. If that's what I want in a book club with my husband or wife and children and grandma, then I better not look for my future spouse in the bar or at the bar, if we're talking legal terms. So reverse engineering your life is thinking, what's the effect that you want and how do you get there? Possible strings, hypothetical syllogisms. And to do that, you need to be curious. You need to be thinking. You need to admit that there's other things outside of your perspective that you need to consider. So you have to be intellectually humble. You need to assume that it's possible that you're wrong because, you know, people are wrong and you're a person, so maybe you're wrong. You need to be synthesizing things, finding commonalities. You need to practice your memory. So if you love drugs that mess with your memory, you're not going to be able to critically think for very long because some drugs mess with your memory. And if you don't remember information, how can you synthesize it? If you don't remember information, how can you expand on it? So you need your memory. Okay, those are just like a bunch of work. Why would you want that? Why is that valuable? We know that poor decisions usually lead to a poor life, but I'm sure a lot of us could name people that they do bad things, but then they're just like lucky. Usually bad decisions lead to a bad life. So who do you know with what you call a low quality life and ask yourself, how did that happen? What did they do repeatedly over a long period of time to end up that way? And then obviously, if you avoid those causes of the effect, you decrease the chance that the same effect happens to you. You haven't avoided it, because there's lots of different ways to end up in a ditch. Good decisions, you might still incur bad situations. But if you find out the causes that led to the bad thing, you can avoid that and decrease the probability that the bad thing happens to you. Think about the people with high quality life. And again, this is subjective. What do you even consider a high quality life? Who are lives? Who do you want to be like? What did they do to get there? Because if you follow their causes, you might end up with their effects. If you do your schoolwork, you'll receive an education. If you get an education, you'll get a degree. If you get the degree, you can get a job. And if you lose your job, you still have a degree, so you can go get another job. That's just syllogisms. If you drink too much alcohol in the evening, it's going to be really hard to wake up. And if it's really hard to wake up, you might be late. If you keep being late, you might get fired. So you have to be thinking modally about what's not happening. You have to be thinking in syllogisms, causes and effects. And all of that takes critical thinking. Where are you thinking about recognizing patterns? Where are you thinking about all of those other things that we mentioned? Evaluating, synthesizing. Because isn't it the case, or at least science tells us, that life is all a chain of causes and effects. So we can reverse engineer our lives. You think about the effect that you want to bring out, and then critically think. What can you do to make that more likely? So let's add this third skill, impartial observation. Now this one's a tricky one because um, I love Immanuel Kant, but we'll get there. 
What is impartial observation? It's when you are rotating your thoughts through multiple perspectives, meaning you don't just have one perspective. You don't just look at things as you. Who are you? You might be a young, studious person who lives in Missouri, who lives in St. Louis, who has an education, who has enough money that they can buy themselves the time to just sit and think about their thoughts. And all of us here are privileged enough to do that. You're just thinking about what somebody thinks who's telling you to think for yourself. So pretty luxurious, pretty luxurious. And what impartial observations require is that you get out of your own head, that you mute your ego. Your ego is your identity. So like, I'm Iranian, I'm a woman, I'm married, apparently, that's cool. I'm 32, I'm a professor. If I want to make an impartial observation, I need to forget all of that about me. I need to mute my ego. And there's this philosopher with whom I am so in love, Immanuel Kant. And he says that everything that you think is accompanied by this preamble. I think. I think is the preamble to everything you think. So when you really just say out loud, hey, I'm going to be at your game, you're really saying, I think I'm going to be at your game. When I say Dr. J is the best basketball player ever, I'm really saying I think that Dr. J is the best basketball player ever. Everything you say has an I think in front of it because you can't get out of your own head. Everything you believe is from your perspective, he said. And I'm telling you, consider your situation from other perspectives. Turn off your ego's monologue and shift through other people's perspectives. Think about your situation as if it was political. Get into a political perspective. Think about the state. Think about the law. Think about other nations. Think about what's happened across the globe internationally. Then take a biological perspective. Think about living. Think about life. Think about ecology. Think about ecocentrism. Take an ecocentrist perspective. Think about how this would affect mosquitoes. Think about how this would affect the soil. Take a sociological perspective. Take a philosophical perspective. Take a historical perspective. Take an ethical perspective. Take an ethnographical perspective. Get out of your own brain and your own identity and your own ego and think about your problem or your situation from multiple perspectives. These are kinds of ways to look at your situation, but you can also think about other types of perspectives. If you have a problem or a situation, ask, what would your mom say if she really knew the predicament in which you found yourself? What would your neighbor say? What would your neighbor or your Emmy or your friend or your professor or your president, your priest, your imam, your rabbi, what would your future spouse say about what you're thinking about doing, about your problem, about your situation? And if you get out of your own mind, you get out of your own subjective experience, and you do rotate through these different perspectives, you are no longer a subject you're now having an objective perspective. You're not just thinking, oh, shoot, what should I do? I don't know. Who am I? You've been thinking, well, my mom would tell me to do this, but my little sister would tell me to do this, and I can synthesize what everyone's opinion has in common. And then I have a more objective perspective on my little tiny one-person predicament. When you put those things together, you become an impartial observer. That means an unbiased observer. Someone who's biased or partial just sees things from their own lens. They're not thinking, how would this affect the disabled? How would this affect people in Russia? How would this affect all the mosquitoes? How would this affect the trees? How would this affect my future spouse? An objective perspective is one that does consider a number of, a wide variety of people's perspectives so that the things you do can make sense, not just for you and not just from your view, but from a wide range. And this is a theory that's been postulated by a philosopher, John Rawls. He tells you to think from behind a veil of ignorance. Ignore the fact that you're black or white or Persian. Ignore the fact that you're a girl or both or neither. Ignore the fact that you're poor or rich or somewhere in the middle. 
Ignore everything about you as a subject and make your decisions as if you could be anybody. Because of course, if we're gonna go and vote on whether we should increase taxes for the rich. We're not gonna vote for it if we're rich because that would affect us negatively. But that's not how you should vote, he says. You should vote for what's right for anybody universally, ignoring the fact that this is gonna affect you in the following ways. So unlike Immanuel Kant, no offense, love him, to critically think is to take on different perspectives and to remove the I before you act. So we're putting all these skills together. I gave you these three main ones. Recognize patterns, make reasonable inferences, take an objective perspective, and all those three things break down into a number of other things. I just gave you two for each. And the value of doing that is that you will have a more enriched life. Your life will be better. The results will not surprise you because you've thought about them. You've considered them. When you do some action, it's the result of you thinking through it and deciding that that's the best thing. So you end up with better decisions. And as far as I understand, good decisions increase your chances of having a good life. So critically thinking, it leads to an enriched life. Hopefully you're now wondering, okay, yeah, I wanna enrich my life. I wanna think critically. I want to do this, I want to, not only work out my physical body, not only work out my lungs so I have stamina, not only work out my heart so that I can live long, but I also want to work on my brain so I can live well. How can I get started? Ready? Well, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, which has free lectures on thinking about this and the other things. 